a newborn baby girl found dumped, literally in a dumpster behind a Wally World Mini Mart. Of course, the baby is dead. You know how many people would pay tens of thousands of dollars to have a baby to love? But no, let's just throw the baby in a dumpster to die. In a dumpster, I mean, I'm not a shrink, but even I know the meaning behind putting your child in trash. It's almost more than I can take in. I'm Nancy Grace, this is Crime Stories. Thank you for being with us here at Crime Stories and on Sirius XM, XM 111. It is reminiscent of another case I recently covered. Listen. Hello, 911. Yes, uh, we just found a baby in the trash behind the, uh, what is it? Uh, damn, I can't think straight. Uh, the Hobbs, what is it? Hey, Griffin, where is it? Where are we at? Where's this, uh, the mall. Hobbs, Broadway. Yes, sir, uh, behind it. We're behind Hogs Mall. Okay, I'm showing you 1218 North. Uh, baby, we just found an infant child. Is it breathing? In the damn trash. Yes, ma'am. Okay. In the I'm middle of the mall, behind the mall, the Hogs Buffet. Okay. Is it clothed? Thorpe and you. Thorpe and you. Is, does the baby have any clothes on? Yes, it is making noise. Okay, do you have a blanket? It is a boy, and he is still alive, I believe. He looks pretty good. That baby lived. That little baby boy lived. And one day, he's going to be told that he was so hated as a newborn, so unloved, the only thing anybody could think to do was just throw him away in the trash. He's going to know that inside the rest of his life. This baby girl doesn't even have that opportunity. She died. Listen. In Decatur, Alabama, a newborn baby has been found in a dumpster behind the Wally World Mini Mart. Police investigation began with a tip called into police about possible human remains in a dumpster. Decatur police found the newborn baby dead inside a bag in the bottom of the dumpster. The body has been sent for autopsy to determine the cause of death. No arrests have been made. This was uh, at Point Mallard Drive at 9 o'clock in the morning. Joining me in All Star Panel makes sense of what we know right now. Uh, but first, I want you to listen to more about what we know about the location where the baby was dumped. Take a listen to our friend, Dave Mack. WTVY is reporting that a baby was found in a dumpster behind a convenience store in Decatur, Alabama. One employee of the store, Carrie Hall, was shocked to realize a baby had been thrown in the dumpster. Hall is quoted as saying, quote, consider that site. It's probably somebody in the neighborhood, probably somebody close to just throw their baby away and not care, unquote. Police have not made an arrest yet. Again, joining me in all-star panel to make sense of what we know right now, but straight out to CrimeOnline.com investigative reporter Nicole Parton. I want to start with the narrow line of questioning regarding the discovery of the baby. Who, what, where, and why? Explain. So the local police department there received a tip um, that they should check this dumpster behind this gas station, this Wally World Market. They went out um, and they dug through the trash beneath the large trash bags that the convenience store had put out from their pails of trash every evening by the gas pump. They found a smaller white trash bag, and in that trash bag they found this beautiful baby girl who unfortunately was already deceased. Um, Wally World, to my understanding, is kind of like a Six Flags or a Disney knockoff. I mean, it's a fun place, and this was a Wally World Mini Mart. Explain that to me, Nicole Parton. 
Uh, yeah, it's just the name that they used. It's actually just a gas station. Um, it's just a convenience store there. In kind of a rural area, Decatur has about 50,000 people who live there. This particular gas station at, at Point Miller Drive is Point Mallard Drive is in a rural area. Um, it's kind of where you go get your cup of coffee in the morning and you, you know the guy that you see in front of you because you see him there every day. So this community is shocked to think that someone in their area has placed a baby girl outside in the dumpsters. Wally World uh, was a name used later in a National Lampoon movie, and it was based on a short story named Vacation 58, where uh, the stars of the story were trying to make a trek to an amusement park. So the irony behind the name of this, Wally World Mini Mart, you think about children having fun and being with their families, and now you're at a Wally World Mini Mart, and behind it, in the trash, in a dumpster, left to die or already dead, is a beautiful baby girl. Now, you were hearing a 911 call earlier regarding the case of Alexis Avila, and um, I'm always stunned that this doesn't end. It goes on and on and on. Babies thrown in dumpsters like their trash. I mean, I need a shrink. Dr. Angela Arnold is joining me, renowned psychiatrist out of the Atlanta jurisdiction. You can find her at AngelaArnoldMD.com. Angela, uh, I'm just a trial lawyer. You'll have to explain to me not the symbolism, but the psychopathy behind putting your baby in a dump. Have you, uh, you know what a, a, a dumpster, well, I don't know, because you've never looked for evidence in a dumpster as I have. It was um, a, a dumpster behind a restaurant, and it smelled to high heaven. I can't imagine putting a baby in there with the flies and those big green flies that bite and, and maggots and worms and, and rotting food and everything out of the bathroom, the bathroom trash, and you put the baby in there? Well, Nancy, I believe that that speaks more to an act of desperation by someone who is either not attached to the baby through the pregnancy and or scared to death of what this means for their life. So they've not formed an attachment to this baby that has been growing inside of them for nine months, that they've probably, they've probably tried to hide this pregnancy for the whole time. So instead of becoming joyous over bringing a baby into the world, these people are scared and they do not know what alternatives they have. James Shellnut is joining me, a uh, renowned lawyer with the Shellnut firm. And what I like about him is he did 27 years in Metro Major Case. He was also a detective, former SWAT, former judge, former municipal prosecutor. And you can find him now, shellnutlawfirm.com. James, Dr. Angie Arnold sounds suspiciously close to defending the mother that we believe put this baby dead in the dumpster or put the baby in the dumpster to die with all the bathroom trash and the refuse and the rotting food and the flies and the larva. Yeah, she seemingly is defending the mother. Oh, I, I agree. Uh, and nothing against Dr. Angie Arnold. I'm an Angie Arnold fan, but I will tell you, I adamantly disagree. I with was this. a fan until about why. two minutes ago. Go ahead. <laughs> well, I will tell you why. You know, if you look at just the mere fact of where this child was discarded, mm. like you said a minute ago, like a piece of trash, this child wasn't placed somewhere on a doorstep. It wasn't dropped off at some hospital. It wasn't dropped off at some family home. It was thrown where you would throw trash that you never want to see again and never remember again. And to me, as a detective, that looks like a person who is selfish, who is self-absorbed, 
and has no concern whatsoever for the human life of this innocent child. And also, Shellnut, there are safe haven spots all over the country where you can take the baby. You can take the baby to hospitals, to law enforcement, to family, you know, but to kill the baby, this is outright a murder of a defenseless infant, the tiniest, the most helpless in our societies. That is murder, Shellnut. Yeah, you know, it's concerning. And, you know, I, I don't know what the excuse will be as far as to why this person did this. When oh, they're dear Lord in heaven. Are you asking me to prove motive? Do I well, need to I prove th- motive? Why does anybody I, I do anything? I, Why does Scott well, Peterson you, kill Lacey? Because he wanted to be free. He didn't want to be married anymore. Why does anybody do anything? Well, I will tell you, I, you know, in Alabama, which is where this happened at, Alabama has some interesting laws. One of the laws Alabama has is a chemical endangerment that causes the death of a child. Now, I don't know what the... It, what the autopsy will show on so this So basically, child, you're, li- you're, you're flapping your wings into a flight of fancy because well, you have no well, idea whether there was any drugs or alcohol involved. And P.S., voluntary use of drugs or alcohol is not a defense. Oh, I agree with you. My, so my point can is I interrupt she, could be trying to save their own, she could be trying to save her own skin because at some point this child is going to be serologically tested this child is going to be looked at for any signs of physical abuse. And under Alabama law, if there is any type of controlled substance in this baby's system, then now this turns into a Class A felony for the death of this child. Who's it, jumping under in? Under Alabama law, uh, who's, Dr. Who's this? Crowns. Oh, hold it's on. Dr. Let me Crowns, intro you, sorry. Dr. Crowns, and your illustrious background. Dr. Kendall Crowns joining me, not just a medical examiner, but chief medical examiner. You know how hard it is to become chief medical examiner? You can't have a single complaint from any of your clients ever. Oops, sorry, you don't have any clients that can speak. You're the medical examiner. They're all already dead. Chief medical examiner, Tarrant County, Fort Worth. But joking aside, you have to climb up the ladder, perform thousands and thousands of autopsies to become the chief medical examiner and Tarrant County, lecturer, University of Texas, Austin, uh, and Texas Christian University Medical School. So I defer to you, Dr. Kendall Crowns. Go ahead. Well, I'm just sorry to interrupt the conversation, but the the discussion of whether the mom is using a chemical or something like that, if she placed a breathing baby into a trash bag, uh, that's asphyxia. So I, I think that, uh, you know, you, you're dealing with a homicide. Not only have you placed the kid in a trash bag where they cannot breathe, but then jettison them into a trash can. So I'm unsure of why there'd be even a question of whether the mom was intoxicated or not. Joining us right now, a very special guest from uh, National Programs for Child Help at childhelp.org and childhelphotline.org who they are an establishment that I really believe in. They truly care about children. When you donate to them, your money is going to help children, not to the, 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 the president and the vice president and the vice vice president. It goes to help children, child help. Dot org. Michelle Fingerman with us. Michelle, when will it end? When will we quit finding babies in dumpsters? We talk about it all the time, Nancy. I mean, we hear this time and time again, and we're devastated each and every time. Um, another innocent life lost. So we talk a lot about how can we prevent this from happening? What resources? There's no defending the action. There's a baby that's dead now because of these actions. But what can we look at to prevent these from occurring in the future? And that's part of the role that we play here on the hotline 
is talking to people that may be in crisis, talking to family members when they have concern about somebody. What options do they have so we can intervene before something like this happens? You know, I'm thinking back on John, David, and Lucy, who, believe it or not, are about to turn 16. It's been the best 16 years of my life. They were extremely premature. Uh, they were both in the NICU, neonatal intensive care unit, for weeks. Lucy was born at two pounds. Two pounds. She was smaller than a kitten. And that little thing, lying in the incubator at the hospital, would hold up one arm in the power sign. And she would lay there like that. And oh, of course, they were both in incubators. We would sing to them. We would stand there. We would watch them. They had so many tubes going in and out of their bodies. And they were so fragile. And I'm thinking about this little baby in a dumpster, covered in trash, either dead when she's thrown in there or dying there, not understanding what was happening around her, nobody holding her, nobody loving her, nobody feeding her, or short, short little time on earth, just awful. And I'm trying to figure out to Dr. Kendall Crowns, how do you look at a baby and determine its age, how many days, how many weeks, how many hours old it is? So there's actually a number of measurements that have been put together over time. Uh, one of them is foot length. You can use a foot length to determine the gestational age of a baby and get pretty accurate from it. Foot length, what else? I believe hand length is another one and then overall length of the baby, although that one isn't as, as specific as foot Dr. length. Dr. Kendall Crowns, do you have children? I do. I have five children. Well, you do remember what they looked like when they were first born, don't you? Yeah. Okay. So do you remember what they looked like a month later when they started to get a little baby fat on them and they were rounding out and they're no longer that pinkish, reddish color when they're born and they're starting to get hair and their eyes are focusing. Their eyes look different when they're first born. You can tell they can't really see. Um, they're looking around. They can't really see. But in a week or two, you can tell the eyes are focusing. The eyes actually physically look different. Would you agree with all of that? Yes. But you're telling me the only way that you, a renowned physician with thousands of autopsies under your belt, lecturer at two fantastic universities, the only way I can tell how old a baby is by the foot and the hand length? And overall length of the body, yes. They look well, different, look doctor. As well. I mean, I'm a JD, not an MD, but I know a newborn baby from a baby a week old or six months old. You can look at them and tell. So are we talking about gestational age once you've been born and then you've aged over time? Or are you talking about a child that has died in utero and has come into the The office, baby in the, the dumpster. That baby. Right. Why so, would I be right. talking about a baby in utero? That's not even a topic because today. Because often with these uh, dumpster babies, they uh, are born prematurely and die at the time of birth. So you have to get an idea of what gestational age they were at to move forward with a determining cause. I know of what you're doing, death. doctor. You're using all of your fancy medical jargon on me because you know I don't understand it. But isn't no, it true? No, that's not my goal. But. <laughs> isn't it true you can look at a baby and tell if it's newborn, just born, or three weeks old? <laughs> newborn, just born, or three weeks old. So newborn and just born would, to me, be the same. <laughs> but yes, you can tell that they're had a survival time period. Okay, and that, and James Shelnut, is why you never put a doctor on the stand unless you really have to, because they will outthink you if you ask them any medical question. Just, you know, forget about it. Would you agree with that? Unless you really yeah. have to. 
<laughs> oh, I think you stay within your specialty for sure. When you don't, you get exposed. Yes, I've been exposed. As I'm not an OBGYN. There, I said it. Okay, uh, <laughs> I want to get back to this baby and what the H E double L happened. Uh, but I'm just thinking about what we just talked about to Dr. Angela Arnold. And, and, and for those of you on the panel that haven't spoken up yet, again, this is not high tea at Windsor Castle with Charles and Camilla. You can jump in, Irv Brandt, if you have a thought, all of you. Dr. Angie, I, I'm trying to figure out which one is really worse to leave your baby to die in a dumpster just after you've had the baby, just given birth, or you have it around for two or three weeks and you take care of the baby, and I assume you would get attached to the baby and then throw it out. They're both horrible. Or, oh, are you going to defend the, the perp again? No, I'm not. But, you know, Nancy, when you talk about, and I do believe it's worse to keep the baby around for a couple of weeks and then kill it, but I also think it might be two different disease processes. So the first one, when you get rid of a baby, when it's just been born and it comes out of you, I do believe that it has to do with, number one, a lack of attachment, and number two, some sort of feeling that that there's that there's trouble and you you're, she's not going to be able to take care of the baby. Two to three weeks later, if a baby is disposed of, that has more to do with some sort of postpartum depression episode. Depression okay? is the, not a defense. But, but, okay, but I'm just telling you as a doctor, as a psychiatrist who practices, who takes care of these women all the time, there is a difference. I'm depressed. Can those... I just go ahead and shoot Jackie right now? No. no you and, I, and, and, and Nancy, I don't what? believe you're depressed, okay? But when you take care of people who truly are depressed, Nancy, it is, they can't see their way out of it. You can't, you can't shake them out of it. They literally can't see their way out of it. Okay. You know what? So yes, there is a difference in getting rid of a baby at those two different times in the baby's, in the baby's life. Okay. You know what? I You're not, not the only baby specialist on today because we've got Nicole Parton, who is mother of 10. Yes. One, zero, 10. And she did it willingly. It's not like I accidentally got pregnant. She adopted many of these children. And many of them have learning disabilities and all sorts of issues they're trying to overcome. So, Nicole Parton, I, I, I can't say enough what a hero you are to so many. But you have taken in children and adopted them that have been abandoned by their parents. How has that affected them? Absolutely. I can speak firsthand. Um, I'm raising four beautiful little girls who were abandoned by their mothers. And even after being in a loving home where I adore them, I have a daughter who's been with me for seven years now, and she still is traumatized remembering the day that her biological mom left her to die. And she's still on days when she's feeling less than or having a hard day, will say, Mama, you're not going to leave me, are you? You're not just going to give me away, are you? Even after therapy, even after seven years of love in a stable home, these children suffer tremendously knowing that the mother who birthed them, the person who's supposed to protect them, just threw them away or set them aside or left them to die. It's tragic. And even though we do everything we can to help them overcome, it is a struggle that they deal with. Sadly, sadly, these biological parents who do this, I don't even know if they have any clue what they're doing to their children. So who is the perp? Who did this? And not just throwing the baby into the trash, but, quote, according to the cops, stuffed in the bottom of the dumpster under several other large bags of trash. Take a listen to our cut, six from Crime Online. Police in Decatur, Alabama, were contacted about doing a well-being check on 36-year-old Cindy Crow. According to WAFF, 
A family member believed Sydney Crow was eight months pregnant, but when she saw her, it looked like she had lost a lot of weight overnight. Her sister believed she'd given birth and was concerned about where the baby was. Before calling police to check on her sister, the family member said that as Cindy was leaving her home, she noticed a large white trash bag in the back floorboard of the car she was driving. When the family member tried to look in the bag, Crow refused to let her. Crow then left, headed to their aunt's house. While Crow was gone, her sister looked into some other trash in the house and found bloody feminine products. When she arrived at her aunt's house, she noticed the trash bag was no longer in the car. Wow. That is a lot of information from CrimeOnline.com. The family noticed that suddenly this woman, Cindy Nicole Crow, had lost a lot of weight, a disturbing amount of weight. Then when asked to look in a white trash bag in the black back floorboard of her car, she wouldn't let her. There are some real indicators right there, but there's more. Listen. Police followed up by contacting Cindy Crow at her job. They were able to convince Crow to go to the hospital and prove that she was not pregnant. WAFF 48 reports, while waiting for the test results, Crow gave an officer consent to search her cell phone. A Decatur detective found that Crow had Life 360 on her phone. That app allowed the detective to trace the route Cindy Crow took when she left her home on Monday to go to her aunt's house. Joining me right now, Irv Brandt, Senior Inspector, U.S. Marshal Service, International Investigations Branch, Chief Inspector, DOJ, Department of Justice, Office of International Affairs, author of multiple books, including Solo Shot, Curse of the Blue Stone, Flying Solo, Top of the World on Amazon, and inspired by all of his trips around the world investigating cases and tracking down fugitives. Irv Brandt, that's a lot of police work that has actually gone into this case. And it all started, Irv, with family members asking for a welfare check on a relative that had lost a ton of weight, a ton of weight. And I don't mean over a period of months if they're on a Zempic or something or we govy, but a drastic amount of weight just gone. Then they get suspicious of a white trash bag in the back of their car. I'm suspicious about them being suspicious. If I see a white trash bag in somebody's car, I don't really think anything about it. I certainly don't want to look into it. So something must have made them very suspicious about that trash bag, Irv Brandt. I agree, Nancy. And from the way the facts that we know about the case right now, it appears that these family members suspected this all along. That's why they called the police. And when the police started to investigate and probably in the initial interviews mm-hmm. of her, you know, decided that there was something very, very wrong. Yes, she's taking lying. Her to the hospital. That yes, exactly. That she's lying. Then when they got consent to go into her phone, that investigator was looking for something very specific. And he what would that be, or for Brent, GPS. looking for what? He was looking for her to, being in the track dumpster. Her movements. Explain yes, how Life Three Sixty works. Movement. The the app is. You know, a, a lot of apps. I love it, that by the way. Track. Parents love to use it, uh, put it in their children's phones. Uh, there's a lot of different uses for these apps. And that police officer, that investigator, had something specific in mind to track her movements if they possibly thought that this baby had been disposed of in another location, which ultimately... It turned out that it was. Now, Dr. Angela Arnold joining me, a renowned psychiatrist out of the Atlanta jurisdiction. Uh, Now, remember, to be a psychiatrist, you have to get your medical degree, and then you go on after that. So we're talking, let's say, four years of undergrad, three or four years of medical school, and then more. Then you get your specialty in psychiatry. Now, Dr. Angela Arnold tried to tune up earlier about this poor young maybe a teen girl that had gotten rid of her baby because she didn't know what to do. Okay, BS, the woman's 36 years old. I think she knows what's happening, Dr. Angie. I completely, 
completely agree with you. So it's a completely different story. And why was she hiding the pregnancy from her family? My other question is, which I imagine many of your viewers have also, is was she denying help from the family? Did the family try to help her through this? Or were they all just sitting back from afar going, I think she's pregnant, but nobody was helping her because that could have been the case also. Or was she denying help from her family? And by the way, that baby didn't get there on its own. Where was the father in all of this? Yes, where is the father in all of this? And remember at the hospital, she took that pregnancy test. Take a listen to our friend Dave Mack. WAFF-TV reports the test results for Crow came back positive for pregnancy. Staff at the hospital said Crow was seen at the hospital in February 2023, and she was six weeks pregnant at that time. Her due date, October 13th. With this information, Crow agreed to go back to the Decatur Police Department, where she was interviewed by the detective. Crow told the detective that she was at the hospital in February, and she was pregnant at that time. Crow then told the detective that she had a miscarriage not long after the hospital visit. Okay. I almost said, wow, I wonder if the cops felt bad about, you know, aggressively questioning a woman that apparently had just given birth and chosen to throw her baby in the trash, what was going on in her mind. But wait a minute, she has the wherewithal to lie. She's lying. Oh, yeah, I had a miscarriage a while back because... Uh, Help me out, Dr. Crowns and Dr. Arnold. Why would you still be testing positive for pregnancy if you had the miscarriage a couple of months before? Hello? I don't know. It's Crown. a couple months. But can you hear me? Hello? Yes, I can now. Go ahead. Okay. I don't know if a couple of months, but if you had the baby a couple of months before, if you would still be showing the hormones that would give a positive pregnancy. February 2023. She said she had a miscarriage shortly after the hospital visit in Feb 2023. Those are months, oh, yeah. months before. Why yeah, would you still have make, pregnancy hormones? It wouldn't make sense that the pregnancy hormones would be still be there months later. I, that, that I, I can't give you a good explanation. For. So that's a lie that she... Still would, had pregnancy hormones, and her, her miscarriage, according to her, had been seven, eight months before. Okay, but then we learn more. Listen. Cindy Crow agreed to speak to the detective and was taken to the Decatur Police Department. WAAY 31 reports that during the interview, Crow confirmed the hospital February 2023 hospital visit and that she was pregnant at that time. She claims that she had a miscarriage shortly thereafter. She then admitted that she did have a white trash bag, but claimed that it contained trash from the car she was driving. When the detective asked where the trash bag was, Crow provided multiple locations that were all determined to be false. Oh, what a tangled web we weave when first we practice to deceive. Didn't anybody learn anything from Watergate? The cover-up was much worse than the crime, for Pete's sake. Here, we're, we've got an a horrible crime and now a cover-up lying about it uh, all the locations she gives about the trash bag are false her fake miscarriage is false everything is false and it shows she has the wherewithal to lie to doctor uh, in other words she's not insane she's not having a um, break from reality she knows enough to lie and lie very well to Dr. Kendall Crowns, how can you tell when you look at a baby if the baby was stillborn or if the baby lived and was then killed? So one of the things you can do is what we call the float test, where you take the lungs uh, from the baby and place them in a jar of water. And if the lungs float, uh, then the baby took a breath and survived the birthing process. If they sink to the bottom, then the baby was more than likely a stillborn. The unfortunate thing with the float test is if there's any decomposition, because especially with these dumpster babies, they're not often found right away, and the decomposition process starts, bacteria starts producing gases, and the gases in the, uh, make the lungs actually float. 
so that can throw that test off. The other thing you can look for is histologically looking for um, expansion of the air spaces in the lungs, which again can show that the baby possibly took a breath. Mm. But if any CPR was done, that can disrupt that test as well. So there aren't a lot of good tests to determine whether the baby was alive at the time of birth or not. We just have a few uh, that we can use. To Irv Brandt, how do you go about proving this case other than you've already caught the mom in a lie, a couple of lies? Well, that's going to be uh, mostly with a homicide investigation. Once it starts, it becomes a homicide investigation. Yeah. Uh, uh, the suspect, Crow, has already given statements that's, like you said earlier, a weave of lies. And it's going to come down to her admitting, and it's going to be an admission on her part. It almost always is in cases like this. Uh, when confronted with the evidence, when confronted with the lies that she told, she's going to end up admitting to what she has done. And there's also the issue of following her trail. Does Life 360 show that she went to the dumpster site? Does her nav system in her car show she went to the dumpster site? Do surveillance videos behind or around Wally World show her pulling in and leaving? If so, what day? She obviously is not going to have a mental defect defense because she knows enough to lie to her family, to go to a location, put the baby in a dumpster, to lie to police about where she's been, about her miscarriage, uh, about the white trash bag. Her lies are becoming intricate, and they're very hard to keep straight once you start a, a tangle of lies. Um, I was speaking earlier to Michelle Fingerman, v VP of National Programs for Child Help at childhelp.org. I can't really stress childhelp.org enough. It never seems to end. Take a listen to our Cut 15. The lead line in Newsweek said, they were the perfect teens. Then she got pregnant. They got scared. Amy Grossberg and Brian Peterson. Brutalized and discarded in a dumpster, the victim of Amy and Brian was their unnamed newborn child. It was November of 96, and Grossberg had hidden her pregnancy from her parents before moving to Newark to attend the University of Delaware. Peterson was attending college in Pennsylvania, but rushed to Newark when Grossberg's water broke and checked them into the Comfort Inn. Conflicting stories have made the subsequent events a mystery to anyone except the couple, but Peterson and Grossberg claim they believed the infant to be stillborn, wrapped him in a garbage bag, and disposed of him in a dumpster. If they believed the child was stillborn, why was it brutally beaten dead? Um, but in this case, Dr. Angie Arnold, the mom is a 36-year-old grown woman. Right. So, Nancy, we all know that that means that she knows better. Well, that's well and put. I, but, you know, but Nancy, I agree. What's going to happen is what she's going to find out is that there's so much information that's going to tie her to this that there's no way she's going to get out of it. She's going to have to admit to this. It's a very, and I also believe, Nancy, you know, the fact that as you were talking about the dumpster and the fact that she literally dug under the trash in the dumpster to put the baby, she did know what she was doing. She didn't want that baby to be found. And she dug under all of the trash she and put the baby did. under the trash. Michelle Fingerman joining me, VP National Programs, childhelp.org. Michelle, what are alternatives for mothers that don't want the baby. Listen, I don't understand. I can't relate to that. I wanted a family so badly. And again, these have been the best 16 years of my whole life or the, the time I've had with John, David, and Lucy, my children. But for moms that don't feel that way, what are the alternatives? What can they do, Michelle Fingerman? There's choices. There's obviously positive choices that don't have to result in babies dying. There's adoptions. We have safe haven laws. You know, there's free confidential help where somebody in the situation can pick up a phone or send a chat or text 
and understand what options that they have that will give this baby a chance in life. What alternatives, when you say safe havens, could you explain that, please? Yes. So so taking babies in Alabama, there's safe haven laws, taking babies to emergency room departments. Recently passed a law where they're going to expand that, where you can take babies within so many days, three days. Um, I think that's expanding to 45 days in Alabama, where they can go to a fire station and take the baby there. So from there, the professionals can handle it to make sure that this baby gets the medical attention that this girl needed, um, can be on the pathway to finding a family that wants, wanted to raise her. If you or someone you know doesn't want the baby, dial toll free to childhelp.org. They will help you find a safe haven to take the baby, and you won't get in trouble. There will be no prosecution. There will be no judging, no shaming, and the baby will live. The number is 800-422-4453. Repeat, 800-422-4453. You can find all the information at childhelp.org. And as for Cindy Nicole Crow, Booker. Goodbye, friend. Guys, thank you for watching Crime Online with Nancy Grace here on YouTube. To get the very latest, subscribe to Crime Online here.